Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you very much for joining me here again today. So last week we spoke about the case of JC Hess and Chris Lassachan and if you haven't seen that I will link it up here for you. But we will talk about that case once the trial has concluded but that case was as devastating as it was unnecessary and my condolences go out to the families involved in that case. But today we are talking about a case that may sound quite familiar if you watch a few of my videos. And it may sound similar to a case that we have actually covered before, but these actually have no relation to each other. But both the perpetrators in these stories have very similar backgrounds. But today we are talking about the case of the Limpopo serial killer. But for today's case, we are going to head up to Limpopo and hear about the absolutely gruesome crimes that a man named Nkosi Freddy Malaudzi committed over a decade. So with that being said, let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. Limpopo is a beautiful province in South Africa. It is well known for its wildlife, which includes fragments of the Kruger Park as well. Caves that are rich in fossils dating back to the early hominids. But with every beautiful thing, there is an ugly truth. And with Limpopo, amongst its absolute beauty, is the ugly truth that it is one of the poorest provinces in South Africa. The province has a lot of rural areas, more so than urban, and poverty is very high in this province. So with all of that being said, South Africa by itself is already a very difficult country to get a job in, and these are even in the best of times. But with the mixes of poor infrastructure and a lot of government misuse of funding, this spells disaster for the people of our country. And that was no different for Mkosi Freddy Malaudzi, who was known by a lot of people as Freddy. Freddy grew up in Limpopo and he was born in 1962. And at this time, the area that he was born in fell under the Republic of Venda, which is now part of the Limpopo province. But Venda was founded as a homeland by the government back in the day, and it is where a lot of Venda people stayed and where they spoke the Venda language. And like I said earlier, there was a lot of poverty in Limpopo, which there still is. And during the time that Freddie was growing up, his mom and him really struggled and there was often not food on the table at night. Freddie's father was never around. He maybe popped in and out of Freddie's life a couple of times, but otherwise it was just him and his mom. Now, even though Freddie had a very difficult childhood, according to what we had to read, there were conflicting reports about his education, but the consensus was that he left school at around grade four. However, some reports said yes, he did leave school in grade four, but this was in 1980. And like I said earlier, he was born in 1962 which makes him almost around 18 years old in grade four. But like I said, the consensus was that he left school in grade four, which is incredibly plausible and happens very often in our country. Unfortunately, the lack of funds means there's often a lack of food and also the parents are unable to pay for school fees. But a hungry child really suffers and they really are unable to learn on an empty stomach. So I think that this was a really tough environment for Freddie to have as an educational environment, as well as a home environment as well. So you may also be asking, why didn't Freddie's mom go and get grants? Why didn't she go and get money from the government to be able to pay for Freddie's school fees? Well, yes, there was funding for poor children, poor families who are unable to afford school fees and also food on their plates at night. But it would hardly, if ever, go to people of color. We are talking about the height of apartheid in the 1960s, 1980s. So if you are a person of color, you are basically on your own. And if Freddie's mom was unable to put food on the table, that was it. No one was coming to help her. But like we said, Freddie left it around grade four. But then in 1985 was when Freddie's criminal career, I guess, really started. Freddie was caught and convicted of petty theft by the government at the time, and he was told to either give a hundred rand fine or spend four months in prison. And it was unclear which option he chose. But then things got a little murky and we lose around five years of what happened to Freddie. So from his early teens to his early 20s, we completely don't know what happened to him. But like I said, we fast forward five years. So now we are in 1990 and it seemed like all hell broke loose for Freddie. Because when we got to 1990, Freddie was charged with 20 different counts, which included robbery and murder. And it seems as though after Freddie got caught and prosecuted the first time for his petty crimes, 
Something switched in Freddy's mind and Freddy went completely off of his rocker. Freddy would rob people for valuables, money, anything that he could really grab. And during these robberies, something went really wrong and he ended up murdering two people, which he was then convicted for. So Freddy's trial began and in 1991, Freddy was then sentenced and given two life sentences. And genuinely, you would think, okay, all will be okay. He will serve and spend time for what he had done. But is it really a true crime story on this channel in South Africa if the perpetrators really spend their sentence behind bars? So not even five years into Freddy's sentence, Freddy then escaped from the Bobby Yarnsport prison in Pretoria in 1996. And yes, a manhunt ensued for Freddy. And a lot of the guards did go on lookouts for Freddy. They went to the houses in the close proximity, but there was absolutely no trace, no evidence, no news. And it seemed like Freddy just vanished into complete thin air. So between 1995 and 2004, there was no news about Freddy. And Freddy had now been on the run for eight years. And once again, there is a gap in his story. We knew nothing about what happened between 1996 and 2004. And I think it was most likely that Freddie had committed more crimes because if you are on the run from all of these prisoners and police officers, you have to make your money somehow. He couldn't exactly walk into a job to get something without any documents or papers. So he may have committed a few petty crimes on the way. But out of seemingly nowhere in 2004, Freddie made an appearance back in Limpopo again. And I think maybe Freddy was thinking, well, it's been eight years, maybe the police have forgotten about me by now. And I think to be fair, it is probably a fair assumption on Freddy's part, because during the time that Freddy was active in the early 90s, there were a whole horde of other serial killers also committing crimes at the same time. And there are at least three serial killers that we have spoken about on this channel that were active at the same time such as Stuart Wilkin, who remember was Booty Bood. Then there was Sipo Twala and Cedric Marquet. So there was a lot going on during post-apartheid South Africa. But when Freddie returned, he had actually married someone the year prior, and her name was Takalani Florence Ntengwa. And Takalani and Freddie had a baby together. And what do I always whine about when we talk about perpetrators who are triggered by what they actually commit crimes for? Like I always say, good behavior will always be present in prisons unless the serial killer or person who committed the crimes is triggered by people in uniforms or men and women in that area. But you will most likely have good behavior or dormant behavior in circumstances where the perpetrators aren't triggered. Because just after the birth of Freddy's child, Freddy absolutely raged and a switch went off and all hell broke loose. In the beginning of June 2004, Freddy broke into someone's home and stole a few items then left. Then, near the end of June 2004, he broke into another home, but the homeowner was at home at the time and he was an older gentleman and a struggle then ensued and Freddy then left after attempting to kill the man. He didn't, but he left with the man's valuables and leaving this man bloody and bruised on the floor in his home. Then in September, Freddy broke into another home, but luckily no one was home. He just stole a few valuables and then left. And then at the end of September, Freddy broke into another home where two women were at home and sadly he did at least one of the victims. It is unconfirmed whether both were attacked by Freddy, but I highly doubt that this was the first attack of this nature. I think that this is just the first recorded incident. But then in November of 2004, a young woman was home alone. Freddy then entered the home and he was rummaging through her valuables when he then started collecting some of them and she must have startled Freddy because they got into a fight and Freddy did try and strangle her to death. He did try and also beat her to death, but this didn't work. She made a lot of noise. And so he decided to just get out of there with the valuables that he had. And then all of a sudden, Freddy just went quiet again for another eight months. And I forgot to mention that a lot of the crimes that took place in terms of robbery, these crimes all took place around dusk. So it was getting dark and people were all settling in their homes. Then on the 2nd of June, 2005, Freddie breaks into a home of a couple, a married couple. 
and Freddy murders them both in their sleep before robbing them and escaping. Then on the 4th of June 2005, so only two days after the murder of the married couple, Freddy then tries to murder another woman in her sleep after attempting to rape her, but his plan didn't go as he thought it would, and she also made a lot of noise, so Freddy then escaped out of a window and ran home. However, on Freddy's way home, he encountered a police officer. He then noticed the police officer was alone. They then got into an altercation. Why, I don't know. I think Freddy probably ran up and tried to attack him. But him and the police officer got into an altercation. Freddy then stole the police officer's weapon after beating the police officer. And then he ran away with the police officer's gun. But then, in August of 2005, Freddy then enters another home around dusk time, and this was the home of a single woman. Freddy then enters the home, he then rapes the woman, and then he murders her before leaving and taking all of her valuables. So just like before, Freddy then ended up going on a year hiatus and went completely under the radar. He ended up going completely silent, no one heard from him and no one saw him for around a year. Then on the 2nd of August 2006, Freddy breaks into a home of a young single mom of two children. One of the children was aged 7 and the other was aged 5. Freddy then proceeds to the mom of two. And then what he does is he then stabs her to death after he is done. And Freddy didn't just decide to leave. No, no. What he did was he then dragged the mother's two children into the room where he had now murdered her. And he puts the children into the room where their mother is lying naked from the waist down with stab wounds and blood everywhere. He then locks the door with the children and the mother inside and he barricades it so they are unable to escape. And then he sets the house on fire. So the mother was already murdered, but both children ended up passing away in the blaze as well. Then two weeks after this, Freddy breaks into another home where a young 19-year-old girl is at home with her three younger cousins. And just like before, Freddy then entered the home with all of them unexpected. They were all settling down for the night. Freddy then proceeds to scare all of the children as he entered the home, tells them that he's there to rob them, but then he takes the 19-year-old girl into one of the rooms and then rapes her. He then takes an axe that he found outside and then he proceeds to murder the 19 year old girl with the axe before then turning on the three children in the home. One was age 14, the other was age 10 and the youngest was age seven. So police knew that there was a serial killer on the run and they were working on a serial killer profile in order to try and track down what the perpetrator could look like, what area they were probably and most likely in, and where they would most likely attack next. But sadly, in August of 2006, a young lady was home alone, and whatever evil was bubbling inside of Freddy was now fully unleashed, and he took it all out on this young lady, who was also his last victim. But she had just gotten home for the night. It was later in the evening. She unlocked the door and just closed it when Freddy then came storming into her house. This lady was also eight months pregnant at the time and Freddy grabbed her and absolutely started beating her. And when her body was discovered a couple of days later, what happened to her was absolutely gruesome. When police discovered her body, they noticed that both of her breasts had been removed. Her right hand and ear were also gone and part of her lip had also been removed. And when doctors had a look at her body post-mortem, they were not sure whether these parts had been removed during the murder or after she had already passed away. So police now knew that this particular serial killer had a very particular MO, and he would start out by robbing all of the victims, and when there were women inside the home, he would pay particular violence and particular attention to the women. So by this time, police were now knocking on doors. They were asking people in the surrounding area of those who were affected by these crimes, whether they had any information about who could have done it. People all had the similar profile of the man. They all said that he looked very slender and police eventually tracked this apparently muscular and slender person down to Freddy. Because one person who had heard one of the victims scream opened her curtain to see what was happening and she saw a man hop over the fence and she recognized this man because he only lived a couple of houses down and that was Freddy. After then searching the home of Freddy, they found a lot of stolen property which linked to the victims as well as other crimes. 
But during the raid by police, they ended up arresting Freddie's wife because she was in the house with the stolen property as well. And then the wife of Freddie told the police where Freddie was most likely to be found. And the police then went to Freddie's family's business and they actually found Freddie all the way at the back of the building hiding in an unused fridge. Freddie was then arrested and taken to prison along with his wife. Freddie never admitted to anything and he pleaded his innocence throughout the trial. And apparently, right in the beginning of the trial, Freddie grabbed his toddler son and held him very close and threatened the judge that he would just lie on the floor with his son throughout the trial if they didn't let his wife go. Which is absolutely bizarre, but it seems like they did end up letting his wife go because they couldn't really link her to the stolen property, even though it was in her house and in their room. So she definitely knew that Freddie was up to no good what she knew and the circumstances of what he did is unclear. But just as a side note, this trial was most definitely just there to serve justice to the families who had been affected by Freddie's murderous rampage and criminal spree, because Freddie was definitely going to prison regardless. Because remember, he had just escaped from prison around a decade earlier, and he still had to go back and serve the time for the crime that he did prior. But in this trial, it was very difficult to convict Freddie because there were hardly any eyewitnesses and if they were, it was dark. And also there was hardly any physical evidence besides the stolen goods that were found in Freddie's home. But when DNA was done on the body of the last victim, who was around eight months pregnant, they did find Freddie's DNA on her body. And Kozi Freddie Melodzi was found guilty of 28 charges, including eight murders, and in the end, Freddie received 11 life sentences, plus an additional 200 years for the other charges. And the judge actually refused Freddie to serve the two different charges concurrently. And what I mean by this is that remember the first two murders that he was convicted of before that he escaped prison on, Freddie was to serve out those two life sentences first. And if he ever came up for parole after the two life sentences, then his 11 life sentences would then kick in. So basically he was never getting out and there was no chance that he would ever be up for parole either. Freddie was sentenced when he was 46 years old, so it is very unlikely that he will ever leave prison alive if he doesn't escape this time. But this case makes you wonder if the circumstances that Freddie was dealt as a child well, maybe what led him to be the serial killer that he was, because remember from his childhood to his early 20s, there was such a gap in what happened to him, what he experienced, and he always refused to talk to anyone. He never wanted to talk to a psychologist or ever get his side of the story out. He just completely refused and pleaded his innocence. And I guess we will never know what led him to do what he did or if he was just born to kill. But that's it for today. Let me know what you think down below. Thank you very much for all your support and for watching this far. I hope you're all staying safe and have a fantastic weekend further. Bye.